So yes. you're welcome in our uh, webinar Dantel Master Meeting. Uh, and uh, I have to present you. I will do it in French. Then I will let you make Thank your you. presentation. OK? OK. OK. Donc, euh, le professeur, euh, le professeur Angelo Trodan est un professeur visiteur euh, dans l'université d'Alexandria et aussi l'université vé vénitienne. Et c'est un chirurgien maxillofacial. Il a fait beaucoup de recherches, beaucoup de publications. Il est aussi président of International Academy of Ultrasonic Surgery and Implantology. Et, et bien sûr, il a animé beaucoup de conférences partout euh, dans le monde. Un grand nom qui nous vient de l'Autriche. Donc, je vous cède la parole, dear Dr. Angelo. Let's go, my friend. Okay. You can share your screen. Oh. I wish you a warm welcome again from Austria. Uh, temperatures are quite nice here. And uh, today's topic is going to be less risk, more success. Uh, medicine and also dentistry develops in the path of time. And uh, today I want to show you the new gold standards when it comes to bone augmentation, general oral surgery, and um, implant insertion with new methods and with new technology. Before we start with, uh, let's say, the details, I have to once again introduce you and remind you what the basic biological mechanisms are when we deal with jaw bones. Actually, Uh, the dental and oral cranial maxillofacial surgery starts with the very basic knowledge in, of physiology of bone healing, which was demonstrated already by Professor Frost. So, my main profession is maxillofacial surgery, reconstructive surgery. And what you can see here is one of the typical cases I have to deal with every day in my surgery room at my hospital. So what you can see here are multiple fractures of the maxilla and the mandible, and we have to stitch them together and stabilize them with titanium plates and titanium screws. On the other hand, in my private clinic, I do the contrary. I do the uh, reconstruction of the stomatognatic system. As you can see here, we are also dealing with titanium implants and then We place them in order to place prosthetic treatment on them. So basically for the organism, for the, from the standpoint of the bone, these are two different medical issues, but it's one universal system of bone healing. And we know this very, very precise because once you have a trauma on the bone and it doesn't matter if you drill a hole to insert an implant or if you do a bone augmentation or if you just have a fracture, the very first step in every single healing procedure of traumatized bone is the hematoma formation. In the second step, you need, of course, the vascularization because healing tissue needs a lot of oxygen, more oxygen than a stable organ that is just living in its way. So that means we need the vascularization to um, get the collagenous fiber basic texture of the bone. And once the basic collagenous fiber texture is built, then in only in the third step, we have the bony callus formation. That means it starts with the calcification of the collagenous fibers. And this is so important to understand that the basic texture of bone is simply collagenous fibers. And only in the third step, they are calcified. So in the last step, of course, we have constant bone remodeling once the bone is loaded again with physiological loads. So as a take home message in general medical knowledge, um, you always have to remember an injured bone cannot heal without immobilization and the fracture hematoma. Here it comes when PRF steps in, which initializes the vascularization and the periosteal induced bone formation. And just to give you an idea, when we speak about uh, hematoma formation, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And the great deed Professor Schuprum did once was replacing the simple mixture of autologous blood that we collect from the surgical side, centrifuge it, and then build PRF. But PRF is only the better hematoma. This we have to understand. There is 
And then you will understand that there is no much miracle about PRF. It's only to make the good better. So as a take home message, every surgical procedure in maxillary and mandibular bone is an iatrogenic, macroscopic or microscopic bone fracture, like any accidental bone fracture or bone trauma. The bigger the trauma, the longer and uncertain the healing. What does this mean for our everyday work? The least procedural iatrogenic bone trauma, the faster and more predictable the bone healing is. Also, guided bone regeneration and ulcer integration. So, once again, you always have to ask yourself, we are part of the big family of medical disciplines. So when it comes to abdominal surgery and you have to undergo such a surgery, would you choose this one or would you prefer to have a surgery like this? That means minimal invasiveness is the key factor for success in, um, in oral surgery and in pathology. And we always have to think about our patients. This is one of the typical European patients. It's older men and ladies. They want to enjoy life, but once in a while, little accidents happen. And this is when these patients will come into your office and ask you, please, I don't want to experience any time anymore an accident like this. This is what we have to deal with every day. So, what is now the scientific evidence? We are going to speak now about a uh, random uh, systematic review and uh, meta-analysis uh, we did back in 2017, um, asking ourselves to the current state of knowledge, which are the instruments for bone management that fulfill our traumaticity demands best. So for this, we did a systematic review on meta-analysis. It was published back in 2017. You can download it at the International Journal of Oral and Craniofacial Science. Just to give you an oversight about the Prisma flow diagram, what we did at, uh, at the end, we analyzed 129 studies between 2006 and 2017, dealing with differences how do burrs act on bone and how do drills act on bone? So what are the disadvantages of drills? Unfortunately, until now, we only had the drills to work on the bone. But of course, we already know since tens of years what the basic drawbacks are when we work on bone with drills and burrs. First of all, we have a heating uh, of bone about 47 degrees centigrade. With it, which is the critical temperature for the osteoblasts. We have enormous procedural bone loss, and we all have, of course, also a very high imprecision of bone cut simply by the torque moment that are exerted by the rotating movement. And of course, and this is one of the most important issues in working with rotary instruments on bone, it's a very high risk of soft tissue injuries. But now we have to ask ourselves, the new generation of uh, bone surgery instruments that were given to us already back in 2005, which were developing in the last 10, 15 years enormously, how do they act on the bone? This is a very critical question. And the simple answer is, if you see a piezoelectric surgical instrument like a piezotome working on bone, it's not that it cuts or drills like a rotary instrument. No, you're utilizing the so-called cavitation effect. And this cavitation effect you can see here. It's not that the instrument itself touches the bone. No, by the oscillations which happen 20, uh, 28,000 to 36,000 times per second, not per minute, per second, you have all small little gas explosions on the top of the tip and they exert such an enormous pressure that the tissues are separated at their weakest point. That means you don't brush the bone when you want to separate it. No, you just separate it atraumatically. And always uh, in, the, in the lower part, you can find all the uh, references that were dealing with the uh, basic evidence on how these instruments act on bone. 
Once again, you can see here one of our developments. I will introduce it later. It's the transcrestal sinus lift procedure my research group invented. Um, you can see simply by the oscillation, the liquid is adhering to the tip. There is no splurting away of the water, which you find in rotary instruments, which in exactly now is so important because uh, in the COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic, of course, we have to protect ourselves and our patients from this splurting away of water. You can be 100% sure that this won't happen when you use ketsotome instruments. And for each instrument, this cavitation effect has to be proven, as you can see in these high-speed shots uh, in the bottom of the line. And now we get to the soft tissue protection. Just imagine you have to do a... Um, you have to do a bone block transfer, and now you get close to the mandible nerve. You see, we work with the same energy with which we cut the bone on the very, very diligent and soft tissue of the eye. And you see, there is no lesion of the cornea here. You cannot uh, disrupt soft tissues with piezodons, and this is so important. Now you can see without changing the mode or without changing the energy, now, when you get to the bone, you see how nicely it cuts and how precisely it cuts. This is so important to understand because once you work very close to the Schneiderian membrane or you work close to the mandibular nerve or to the mental nerve, this is the decisive point that you may save your patient's sensibility if you protect the nerves. So what are a possible drawback of, um, of piezotones? Well, of course, if you press any of the piezotone instruments very harshly on the nerve, like if, even if you press your thumb on the nerve, if it's a long, too long duration, then of course you will hurt the nerve. But if you decrease the flow rate of the rinsing of piezotone instrumentation, then of course also with piezotones, you can have a terminal impairment and even side effects of piezotone application. So never go below 80 to 70 milliliter of uh, coolant rings once you work with piezotones on human bone. But now let's make a comparison between the rotary instruments and the piezotone instrumentation. When it comes to procedural bone loss, for this, we made a very simple experiment. The task was to cut out a square of one centimeter of bone for autologous bone block transfer, once we did it with piezotomes, once we did it with microbursts, and we also did it with lasers. And what you can see here, when you cut bone with microbursts compared to piezotomes, you lose almost 50% of the bone you want to transfer to another site, simply by using rotary instruments. And in a lot of cases, you will lose so much bone that the main task to augment the site cannot be fulfilled because the resources in the mandible and in the maxilla for the largest bone block transfer are highly restricted. Now let's speak about the quality and speed of bone healing. I mean, this is also very interesting because everybody speaks about immediate loading and how we can speed up the healing cycle in our patients. Uh, for this, um, a friend of our research group, Professor Salva Donaris from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, undertook some investigations. He was cutting bone with rotary instrument and with um, piezotones, and he found out that there is a significant higher bone regeneration rate in sites which were cut with piezotones than in sites that were cut with uh, rotary instruments. And what's even more important is now we know, okay, it's healing faster, but we always want to know why and how. And this is one of the most important findings when it comes to piezotome surgery, to find out that the osteoblast activity and the osteoblast concentration in the field of healing, once you work with piezotomes, after seven days, it's more than double time higher than with rotary instruments, after two weeks, it's more than three times higher than with piezotones. And even after 56 days, it's still significant higher with piezotones 
than with rotary instruments. And this is the explanation why bone heals faster and more predictable without procedural bone healing loss when you work on bone with roots or bones. It's not something we have to hope anymore. We know this now. Now, let's speak about post-surgical morbidity, pain and swelling. For this already, we undertook back in uh, 19, uh, in, in 29. In 2009, we undertook a randomized clinical trial where we compared the removal of impacted third molars in one patient. It was a split knot study in every case. On one side, we removed the impacted third molar with rotary instruments. On the other side, with uh, only piezotone instruments. You can see the surgical tools here for the piezotone. And what we found out was when we take the average pain and swelling rate with rotary instruments at one as 100%, we are able to reduce pain and swelling events in our patients by more than 50% only when we use piezotones. And this we measured on the first, second, third, and seventh day after surgery. Of course, this study was criticized because everybody in the scientific world knew these uh, people from the PKW research group are crazy guys. They, they try to force piezotone surgery. But meanwhile, our study was copied five or six times, and they all found exactly the same results, not only for impacted third molars, but also for all other oral surgical procedures, including orthodontic surgical procedures. So here you can see all the references that were piled up in the meanwhile. It's just to give you an overview what was published in this field. And you're free, of course, to download from our Academy's channel all the lectures and all the papers to read them afterwards. So as a summary of scientific proven properties relevant for the clinician's daily work, we can frankly state, and we know now for sure, evidence-based that, uh, that we have minimal terminal bone necrosis for sure with piezotones, only if you abuse piezotones or you just switch off, switch off the rinsing, then of course also with piezotones you can have terminal side effects. The osteotomy surface, smooth only with piezotones, bacterial contamination prevention by not spilling around all the liquid in the room in the face of the surgeon and in the um, adjacent uh, tissue areas of the patient, only possible with piezotones. Improved bo uh, bone healing, proven for piezotones. High precision bone cut design, proven for piezotones when we compare it with rotary instruments. Almost lossless bone cut, you have seen the pictures before, proven for piezotones. Precise depth control, it depends on the instruments you use, but the precision is much higher with piezotones than with rotary instruments. Prevention of soft tissue injuries, no questions. With piezotones, it's almost, almost impossible to hurt soft tissues, but it's not 100% impossible. So you always have to take all my words with a tick of salt. And significant reduction of post-surgical patient morbidity, simply proven by a lot and multiple scientific studies. So once again, as a take home message, perfect is the enemy of the good. The history of dentistry shows this is how they did it in the medieval ages. The Egyptians already knew how to do prosthetics. At the beginning of the 19th century, a technology was already a little bit more modern, but this is state of the art in the 21st century. That's the state of the art 2020. So we can now for sure state the piezotone surgery is the new gold standard in oral surgery. Now, once again, I have to remind you, we have to serve our patients. And we have to serve our patients as best as we can. And we have to treat them in a way that they don't need to interrupt their everyday life too long. And you see, these are once again the patients that will come to visit you the next day in your office because they don't want to endure a situation like this um, again in any other circumstances. Okay? So, 
But before we get into the uh, specific topics, I just want to remind you that our patient's individual anatomy is very complex. So once again, as a new state of the art procedure in 2020, we should utilize uh, 3D depiction of our patient's anatomy. We call this the digital imaging and workflow. So just to give an idea, okay. Um, what this means when you have a panoramic x-ray, you have a two-dimensional two representation with the third dimension, you can imagine much more and much better how the real situation looks like when you approach the patient, when you do the real surgery at the end. So this is planning in 2D. This was the planning of my clinic in 3D. And of course, with this representation, you can much better imagine how the workflow is going to be when patients enter the clinic and they have to be distributed to the different surgical rooms. Why? We know panoramic X-ray diagnosis only shows a two-dimensional overlay picture and CBCT reveals pathologies, which in a lot of times are unseen in panoramic X-ray. And the um, most modern devices, CBCT devices like the x mind Trium, allows bone quality determination non-invasively before you start your surgery to determine if immediate needle loading is possible or not. Just to give an idea, this looks like a very simple case, periodontal compromise here, no problem to do some sinus lifting here. But once you see the third dimension, you can see that by the thickening of the Schneiderian membrane and uh, by additional diagnostics here, you can see there is a big cyst. So it's not an easy case. And this is how you can depict in the areas once you did the sinus lift, for instance, to determine the bone quality to decide upon is immediate implant insertion and immediate loading possible or not. That's just to give an idea that the new state of art in uh, treatment planning in the digital workflow should be always based in, on CBCDs, especially when it comes to bone augmentation and uh, implant insertion. Okay, so what are the indications for common everyday surgery when we speak about the exotone surgery? Of course, that's the entire range. And this is also scientifically proven. We have enough evidence that every single type of these surgeries, when you compare it to rotary instruments, they are more precise, they are more fast, and the healing is more predictable. So we speak about epistectomy, cyst surgery, extraction, periodontal surgery, and the removal of impacted teeth. Just to give an idea how situations could look like when you work with rotary instruments, this was an impacted third molar with a big uh, coronary cyst. Uh, this is then the situation during the surgery. It's a mass destruction of bone. And of course, the healing is a deficient healing. That means there is not the regular anatomy uh, anymore once the site is healed. And these are mass destructive weapons which kills bone. Contrary, when we take a very similar um, case, this is once again a case with an impacted third molar with a big radicular cyst, still vital uh, second molar. Instead of destroying the bone, you just cut a precise bone plate. It's the same way you cut bone plates when you do autologous bone block transfers. Then with the ligament cutters of the piezotones, you liberate, you cut the periodontal ligament. And in most cases, if you have enough space, you can just gently remove the impact of third molar with a little um, um, ejector like this one. And once you're finished with the surgery, and of course, uh, when you take a look at the full video at our YouTube channel, of our Academy's YouTube channel, you can see then the demonstration that this uh, radical assist was encircling the mandibular nerve. And of course, using piezotones, there was no chance of harming the mandibular nerve. Once you're finished, you just put back the bone plate, you reconstruct 100% the anatomy, and this is the situation six months after the surgery, an almost completed bone healing. And what is more important, this tooth stood vital. 
still vital because this was the biggest problem of the patient after the surgery, of course, that she felt pain on cold um, when she was drinking cold water and, and cold drinks because we were able to leave this tooth vital. And this is only possible with glitzodonts. So when we speak about episectomies, once again, the surgical protocol is a little bit different. Instead of just milling away the bone, which is very, very sensible, especially in the second incisor region, because episectomy is the last chance for the tooth to survive. Of course, in a few years, there will, be, have, there will have to be inserted an implant. So we want to reconstruct the anatomy 100%. So we just cut the bone block, bone lossless. We do the episectomy, we will do the retrograde filling, and then we reconstruct the original anatomy. So once the tooth is extracted, you can insert immediately the implant, and you don't have to fear that the apex of the implant comes out here. So this is why we call piezotome rich preservation. You can see it here. Of course, uh, the traditional way would always be to uh, Mill away the bone. This is an ankylized tooth, uh, an ankylized root fragment. And I want to point your attention to this area here. This is the buccal alveolar crest. We don't want to remove this because we know if we remove this, we have an absolute collapse. Of course, in most cases, you will be able to insert the implant simultaneously because there is no bone loss. And if your implant system fits to the size of the extraction site, there would be no problem. But if you decide to do a delayed implantation, then of course, it's vital that this part of the bone stays intact. And of course, this is just for demonstration. Of course, you can do it flapless when you do it on your own patients. Just to give an idea how this looks like in um, the real life surgery, we have an ankylous tooth here. Adjacent, there are already two implants. And this is how we do it when we use the piezotones. Um, the problem with piezotones is you see there is no action. With rotary instruments, you have to prepare a flap. Okay, let's say it takes you one or two minutes to prepare a clear uh, mucoperial flap. With piezotones, you don't have to prepare a mucoperial to flap. You can just start working right away. But there is no action. There is no bleeding. So for you, it seems to be boring. Okay, it sounds like calculus removal. But actually, it's not. You can see the real time on the left uh, lower corner of the video. And you can already see after 1.5 minutes, you can already see a slight loosening of the tooth. Of course, we want to be 100% precise. We want to cut the periodontal ligament and we have to clear the uh, ankylosis until we, and of course, this is for demonstration reasons, until we can re remove the tooth with two fingers. And this is what I want to show you. There is no bone loss. You see a clean, um, periodontal cut, and these are special tips which were designed by my research group for implant insertion. And of course, once again, I have to remind you, remember the cavitation defect. The cavitation defect means you don't remove bone, you just separate the bone. And this is why when you prepare the implant side with its bone tips, you don't remove the bone like you do with drills. No, you condense the bone, which is very, very important in the maxilla, because actually for the maxilla, you should always drill the hole for the implant undersized, or you do bone compensation to give the implant a much higher primary stability. And you see, once again, there is no bleeding. It's uneventful. To you, it seems it takes such a long time. Actually, you're much faster like uh, instead of having rotary instruments, you're much faster with pizza balls. And maybe you can see, I've got a very, very hard time to insert the implant. And maybe you can see, once you're an experienced uh, implant surgeon, you know how it looks when you have to uh, use a high torque force to insert the implant. 
I always like to do a occlusal check because implants nevertheless should always place in the anatomical correct position. Now we do a intrasurgical x-ray and here you can see the adjacent pre-existent implants and here the additional implant. Now we just place the cover screw and um, at the end, you can see now the sutures. I will now proceed a little bit because we are running a little bit out of time. This is then the situation at the opening, just about three, three and a half months after the surgery, the placement of the abutment, and then the patient went to his uh, dentist to do the prosthetic treatment. Okay, when we speak about guided bone regeneration, uh, we have um, issues like vertical alveolar crest splitting, intralift sinus lift, subarostal tunnel technique, mandibular nerve transposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just pick out today two very, very common techniques. Which first one is the uh, surgical protocol for the flapless piezotome enabled crest split and widening technique, which my research group developed. You can see here the surgical protocol. Just to give an idea how this works, this is the case. We have an area here which is high enough above the mandibular nerve, but very, very narrow. We speak about a one millimeter wide alveolar crest. This is the situation after surgery, and this is then the prosthetic treatment 3.5 months after the initial surgery. Here you can see the pictures directly from the surgery. Uh, the flapless piezotome-enabled crest split um, comprises of a first initial mesiodistal incision of only the very top of the mucosa of the alveolar crest. You don't prepare mucoperiosal flaps. Then the one millimeter wide alveolar crest top can be seen here. We split this with tips that we designed in cooperation with Acton Company. Then we do an initial widening. What is very important is a buccal relief osteotomy on the mesial and distal end of the osteotomy, and then step-by-step step the widening procedure. And you can see here, the bone is paper thin, but what is the most important part? Remember the first part of this lecture, we are speaking about vital bone because the periosteum is still attached to the bone. Then the implants in most of the cases can be inserted immediately. The Space in between is uh, filled with, uh, with synthetic bone graft. It's a self-hardening synthetic bone graft. It's called easy graft. Then we do the wound closure. And after 3.5 months, you can see here now the prosthetic treatment. When we have a radiographic follow-up, this is after one year, after two years, and this is after five years. Another um, three-dimensional representation, this was the original situation with 1.2 millimeter wide alveolar crest in the upper jaw. This is immediately after the crest split and widening. You can see <coughs> how precise the widening is. Then the simultaneous implant insertion, then the placement of the bone graft. This is only possible flapless with its opponents. Uh, we made a comparative randomized clinical trial between autologous bone block, block grafting and uh, piezotone crest split. We presented this two years ago at the EAO Congress in Vienna. The results are speaking for themselves. This is the piezotone crest split, uh, a pre surgical width of the alveolar crest, post surgical width of the alveolar crest, and the procedural bone loss is significant higher uh, with autologous bone block grafts than with piezo bones. And although the difference between the achieved bone width is not significant in favor of the piezo bones, it's still substantially higher. And of course, when we take once again the um, pain and swelling ratio for our patients, you can see significant less pain and swelling for our patients. That means also much faster healing. Okay, as the next step, we speak about sinus lift. You've heard the lecture before. And of course, um, on one hand, we speak about bone grafting materials. On the other hand, we also have to speak about minimal invasiveness when we do sinus lifting. Um, whenever you detach uh, 
the mucosa from the bone and also the sinus membrane is nothing else but a periosteum. The less you cut, the more success. And this is why we developed the transcrestal hydrodynamic intralift system. So instead of detaching the sinus membrane with scratch instruments or balloons, we just detach it by hydrodynamic power. That means hydrodynamic pressure. This was just to give you an idea how it works. Now we will take a look how it looks in the real world. This is the surgical procedure. You open just the booklet flap on top of the alveolar crest, then you prepare with diamond coated pietotom uh, inserts, the access to the sinus floor, you prepare a ventral seat here, and then you detach the sinus membrane by the cavitational forces of the hydrodynamic effect. This is how it looks like in your patient when you do uh, the intralift. This is when the suture is closed. And this is what you can achieve with the intralift system. It's completely comparable to the big, large bone augmentations with lateral approach sinus lift, but just one single 2.85 millimeter uh, diameter hole. This is a clinical case for the intralift. This was the situation before. This is the situation after. One big issue is also that the implant will always be in the center of the augmentation. This is basic physics. Here you can see the picture. Um, this was a surgery for three implants. We start the intralift always in one single trepanation site. And this is then the endoscopic view. When you look from inside the sinus, you see here the hydrodynamic forces, the cavitation effect starts to detach the sinus membrane all around the transcrestal approach. And once the pressure has the right uh, height, then puff, the entire sinus floor is detached. And this happens within five seconds. And it's more safe than any other uh, sinus lift procedure. Now, of course, you want to know, but how can I check if there is a perforation if I don't have an endoscope? This is very simple. All the water you pump in between the Schneider membrane and the base of the bone, once you remove the instrument, all this water flows back again. So you can be 100% sure. And of course, you can also do the Weiss-Cyber test. That means you make your patient inhale, then the sinus membrane floats back into the cavity of the sinus. And once the patient exhales, that means the pressure rises in the sinus, then of course the membrane flows back again. So especially in cases where the remaining alveolar crest height is very, very low, you have full control over the entire minimal invasive procedure. Now this, let's take a look. Then of course you plug the bone graft material, the implants are inserted, and this is then the final result. Three implants inserted by one single transcrestal approach for the intralift. So again, uh, we have to serve our patients with minimal invasive procedure. This is another clinical case for the intralift. You see periodontal disease, uh, teeth have to be extracted. So what did we do? We extracted the teeth, and simultaneously with the extraction, we did a bilateral intralift. And you see, it's always substantial. It means with one single approach of 2.8 millimeters, you can fill the entire sinus floor, bilateral, without problems for the patients afterwards. And of course, since the remaining alveolar crest bound didn't give uh, enough primary stability to the implants, six months later, after the intralift, the implants were inserted in nine months after the intralift. That means another three months for uh, unloaded healing of the implants. Uh, we uncovered the implants. We inserted an additional implant in the extraction site of the canine. And then you can see here, this is the final prosthetic treatment result eight years after the intralift. This was the situation before, and this is the situation the patient is still in right now. Now it's uh, 10 years ago that we did this uh, treatment. And of course, if the patient cleans, this 
result will be long-term stable. Of course, we also did a, uh, a randomized clinical trial comparing lateral approach sinus lift with uh, our intralift system. The most important findings were that the perforation rate of the sinus membrane is more than 50% less than with lateral approach. We have only 5% uh, membrane perforations with the intralift and approximately 15%, and the literature tells us sometimes more higher percentage with lateral approach sinus lift. We had to abort procedures only in 2.5% of the cases. Double time, we had to abort the procedure due to large perforations of the sinus membrane with lateral approach. And of course, the osteotomy time with, uh, for the intralift is significantly lower than with lateral approach uh, technique. The achieved augmentation height was comparable to lateral approach and the morbidity assessment, once again, more than 50% less pain and swelling when you do the intralift procedure compared to lateral approach. Now, at the final stage of this uh, presentation, unfortunately, I had to do it very quick, but you're happily invited to join our uh, Academy's channel for free. Just to give an idea, also uh, subperiostal mucosa preparation with self-hardening bone graft, we use easy graft uh, for the subperiostal tunnel technique, works best with piezotomes. Here you can see the result after this surgery, after 10 years, wonderful stable situation here and a nice uh, bone margin around the implant without resorption due to the minimal invasive procedure at the beginning. And of course, um, uh, when we speak about vertical augmentation in the mandible, in the molar region of the mandible, we are facing a lot of problems when we do this with autologous bone blocks. So why not use the um, innate possibilities of the bone? The only problem we face with, uh, with the uh, lateral side of the mandible, with the molar side, is this nerve that we might hurt when you drill downwards. So why not transforming this nerve very simply, and you don't have to fear any adverse events if you do the preparation with piezotomes, because you might remember how um, I, I put the, the piezotome, the saw of the piezotome on the eye of the sheep. There is no chance if you work correctly to hurt the nerve. You would never do something like this with rotary instruments. And of course, um, as a final summary, the piezotome surgery preserves and stimulates the undisturbed action of the endosteum and periosteum by least traumaticity in soft tissues. And, and this is very important, please always remember this, you're not working like with a rotary tool or with a saw, you're working with a cavitation defect. Piezotome surgery initiates bone healing with the first cut by ultrasonic cavitational stimulation and soft and hard tissue healing. Always remember, when you cut the bone with piezotomes, you have three, four times more active osteoblasts in the healing site, which gives you a much more predictable result. And of course, piezotome surgery leads to more than 50% less patient morbidity. This is just a site on our uh, training courses. This one was uh, done in France. And I just want to show you one very impressive picture nice colleague from St. Petersburg in Russia. He just had this piezotome the first time in his life in his hands. It was a very nice periodontology. He was working, working, working. This was his first experience with um, the piezotome on the raw egg model and see what he did. He peeled off the shell of the entire egg with one single, uh, with one single trial. So, um, I just have to switch back here. Just to give an idea who we are, this is the TKW Research Group. That's me with a little bit more kilos. That's uh, my friend, Professor Andreas Kurek from Germany, Professor Marcel Wainwright from the University of Seville. And um, of course, we also offer training courses, human cadaver head courses, animal cadaver courses, and uh, practical surgical training at the um, University of Innsbruck in Austria and at universities in Asia. And you are highly welcome to join us. And 
if COVID-19 allows, maybe in the future, there will be a chance that they come to see beautiful Morocco and then join you with a hands-on workshop called Piezo Dons. And just make a screenshot now or just note it down. This is the site of our organization. It's the International Academy of Ultrasonic Surgery and Implantology. You don't need to register. You don't need to pay any fees. All the lectures, also this lecture um, you have seen here as a webinar, you can find on our education channel and you find a lot of surgical videos where every surgical procedure with piezotones is explained step by step. I cordially thank you for your audience and I hope I wasn't speaking too fast, but I had to give you an oversight what you can do with piezotones within 45 minutes. And I think I made it right on the dot. <laughs>